Okay, so we're going to start recording now. We are. And uh, yeah, just again, welcome uh, everyone. There's a few of us here and we'll probably be joined by a few more, but um, just by show of hands, who, who was here for or who has seen the last two presentations on biblical archaeology? Okay, a few of us. Cool. So awesome. Yeah, for the guys who haven't, um, this is something that uh, obviously <clears throat> Jody is taking us to. And um, she is an archaeologist, I'll let her tell you more about that. Um, but focusing especially on some of the things that have been found that relate to the Bible. Um, so it's very interesting. I, I definitely learned a lot from this and uh, looking forward to what we'll cover today. Uh, there'll be, uh, we'll probably be going for, I think, about an hour, um, maybe a bit less with the actual presentation, but then we'll have some kind of Q&A at the end. So don't worry about questions as she's presenting, unless she asks you. <laughs> um, but, uh, <laughs> but afterwards, yeah, think of any questions that you'll have for the Q&A. But um, yeah, let me hand it over uh, to Jodie. Okay, thank you. Um, good afternoon, everyone. It's great to be able to do another presentation on biblical archaeology. Um, Ashley was very insistent that I should do a third presentation, so <laughs> here I am. Um, and in this presentation, we will be looking at the David and Solomon debate. Now, in recent years, society has grown increasingly secular, and as it has, um, there's also been an increase in criticism of the biblical text. And a number of scholars of archaeology have put forward theories and ideas which undermine the accuracy of the biblical accounts. So, for example, um, one argument that was prevalent for a long time stated that David wasn't a historical figure. And the reason many scholars came to this conclusion um, was because there was no evidence for David outside of the Bible. None of the Egyptian or Assyrian documents we had mentioned him. He was only mentioned in the scripture. And so it was concluded that David was just a literary creation made up by individuals much later in time. Those advocating these positions were often termed minimalists. They were and are still very skeptical of the biblical text. And so they tend to only base their conclusions on extra biblical sources. An example of this came in 1992 with the release of a book entitled In Search of Ancient Israel by a man named Philip R. Davis. Davis was a biblical scholar at the University of Sheffield. And notice that the title of his book, Ancient Israel, has quotation marks around it. This is because David is arguing that the Israel depicted in the Bible was basically a fairy tale. And in his book, he makes this statement. The biblical empire of David and Solomon has not the faintest echo in the archaeological record as yet. Now, this is a very important claim because David is really central to the biblical text. He's mentioned over 900 times in the scripture. And if you took him out, you'd end up with a very different Bible indeed. But notice in the quote from Davis, the last two words of his sentence, as yet. You see, the argument that is being made is an argument from silence. He's saying, we haven't found any evidence yet, so therefore it never happened. But the danger of making arguments from silence is that there's always a possibility that future excavations might reveal some evidence. You probably know the well known phrase which says the absence of evidence is not evidence of absence. And it's interesting because only a year after this book came out, there was a discovery made at the ancient city of Tel Dan in northern Israel. While archaeologists were excavating at the site, they uncovered a stele, which is a block of stone inscribed with writing. On it, was carved an inscription written in a language called Aramaic, which referred to a battle at the hands of Hazael of Damascus and the subsequent defeat of the King of Israel and the King of the House of David. So this inscription was extremely important because it was extra biblical evidence that clearly 
demonstrated there was a kingdom of David, that David was a historical figure. It's interesting that the kingdom of Judah is referred to as the house of David, because that's the same terminology that's used throughout the Bible. But not everyone was satisfied. And some of the minimalist scholars argued that it was a forgery. Um, others said that it had been misread or misinterpreted. However, the arguments they proposed didn't carry much weight. And today there is little argument among scholars as to the historicity of King David. But now the argument has shifted slightly and it's transitioned to an argument of chronology. Scholars are now debating the nature of the kingdom of Israel and Judah. They argue that the kingdom of Judah developed after the kingdom of Israel and that there is no united monarchy as the Bible records. This was largely influenced by a book that came out by two scholars, Professor Israel Finkelstein and his colleague Neil Asher Silberman. Um, they accept David was a historical figure, but they question whether David's kingdom was really as great as the Bible describes. So in their book, they present a number of arguments. Firstly, they argue that David's kingdom was just a sparsely populated hinterland, that it wasn't as extensive as the Bible records. They state that there's no evidence for major buildings or fortifications. They argue that Jerusalem was just a small village and also that there's no evidence for extensive literacy. Um, so these have been some serious challenges um, that have been raised recently, although it's worth mentioning that these are also arguments from silence. Now, if you wanted to search for answers about the nature of the Kingdom of Israel during the reign of David, you may think that Jerusalem would be an obvious place to investigate. Um, after all, according to the Bible, Jerusalem was the capital that David set up. But Jerusalem can be a difficult city to excavate because mod the modern city is actually built on top of much of the ancient city which means archaeological excavations are often limited to small areas. Uh, that being said, there have been a number of excavations carried out at Jerusalem. Notably, in 2005, archaeologist Elliot Mazar uncovered a substantial stone structure in Jerusalem, which seems to date to the beginning of the 10th century BC, which is the time of David. Elliot Mazar along with many other scholars, believe that this substantial stone building was a palace. And since it seems to date to the 10th century BC, they identify this as the Palace of David. Uh, now, there have been many debates on both sides over the, that interpretation. Um, but since then, another site in Israel has been excavated. And that site has proved to be very important in this debate. The name of that site is Kerbet Kayafa. Now, Kerbet Kayafa is located here in the Ila Valley between Sokka and Azaka. Um, in ancient times, it was situated basically on the border of Judah and Philistia, along a main road that leads to Jerusalem. So how was the site discovered? Well, in 2003, a man by the name of Sarganor visited the area. Unfortunately, looters had used metal detectors at the site to hunt for ancient coins so that they could sell them on the antiquities market. Now, at the time, Sarganor had been working with the Israel authorities to try and prevent people from looting sites. So as part of his work, he examined the area. He soon realized that these archeological ruins were different to other ruins in the surrounding area. And he began to suspect 
that the remains might be very important. A couple of years later, Sa was attending a seminar on biblical archaeology given by an archaeologist called Josef Garfinkel. After the seminar, the two got talking and Sa shared his thoughts about this site he'd examined. In the end, they decided to go out and to have another look. So, early one February morning, Sarganor and Josef Garfinkel took a road trip to Kerbet Kayafa. They decided to organise a small two-week excavation to establish the site's preservation before committing to a large-scale excavation. And after the two-week dig, it became clear that the site had only been occupied for a short period of time. There was some evidence of late Persian, early Hellenistic occupation, but there was also an occupation layer that dated to the biblical period during the Iron Age. And even from these short two weeks, it was evident that the biblical period was very impressive, with large walls surrounding the city. They also found broken pottery on the floors, indicating that the site had been destroyed suddenly. So after these two weeks, all their initial doubts disappeared and they started planning a full excavation. Now, often with research projects like this, it's useful to partner with another institution. Um, that way you can get a broader range of support. So Josef Garfinkel of the Hebrew University approached Michael Hazel of Southern Adventist University and excavations began. Here's an aerial photograph of Kerbet Kayafa. And when you start to examine their findings, you begin to realize that this is more than just a small village. This is a fortified site. If you take a look at a plan of Kerbet Kayafa, you can see that the types of walls surrounding the city are casemate walls. Um, now I know what you're thinking, what on earth is a casemate wall? <laughs> um, well, I shall show you. Um, so casemate walls, basically two parallel walls, um, like you see at the bottom there, um, with a short horizontal wall in between, which creates a kind of chamber. Um, and these were really useful because in times of peace, these chambers were used as storage rooms. But if a city was in danger of being attacked, they would quickly fill the chamber with dirt and stones to create a much thicker, more solid defensive wall. Um, now in several uh, places, as they excavated the walls, uh, the archeologists found that the wall was built directly onto the bedrock. And this is useful not only because it gives more stability in an event of an earthquake, which occurred a fair amount in Israel, um, but it also uh, was a very good defensive strategy as well, because one method of conquering an ancient city was to actually tunnel underneath the outer wall to get access inside, or at least to undermine a section of the wall so that it would collapse. But if you're building directly onto bedrock, it's virtually impossible to tunnel underneath. Here's a photograph of the wall. You can see the casemate walls a little more clearly there um, with the two parallel walls and the short vertical wall in between creating the chamber. Um, now, if you take another look at the plan of the site, you can see um, another interesting feature is that the houses are built directly up against the casemate walls. Also, when you look at the entrances to the chambers, you see they're consistently positioned in the furthest corner from the city gate. Um, so if you just go back um, to the photograph, you can see it a bit more clearly. Um, on the left, um, you've got the entrances on the left of the gate. And then on the right, it's cut out slightly, but the entrances are on the right side, so furthest away from the city gate. Um, and 
that's very interesting. <laughs> um, but why is it important? Um, well, it demonstrates that this city didn't develop randomly. There must have been some kind of central organization or administration that was intentionally planning the city. There would also need to be some sort of central organization in place to oversee the construction of the city and to organize all the resources needed to build it. And considering there were a few thousand tons of stone being used to build this site, the task would have been pretty significant. It's interesting that the type of construction used at Kerbuk Kayafa is seen elsewhere in Israel at Judean sites. But what's significant about Kerbuk Kayafa is it's actually the earliest evidence we have of urban planning using these methods. So we have a fortified site in Judah, which seems to have been constructed after careful planning by some kind of central administration. But how do we know when it dates from? Well, during these excavations, they found a lot of these pottery fragments. Um, now, there are a few different ways to date a site, uh, such as stratigraphy or carbon-14 dating, but pottery is actually the most common method used because it's found all the time. It's not really possible to reuse pottery, so once it's broken, people just throw it away. Now, different cultures made different styles of pot, so their size, their shape, their decoration might all differ. And these pottery styles would change fairly rapidly. And that enables us to work out the date of a site based on what type of pottery is found. So it's a little bit like cars. Cars have changed over time too. And someone who was an expert at makes and models of cars would be able to look at a car and tell you that's the 1980s Ford Fiesta. And it's the same kind of thing with pottery. An expert in ceramics could look at a pottery fragment and be able to tell you this is Philistine ware or this is an Egyptian pot and it dates from the Iron Age or it dates from the Bronze Age. So they found lots of these pottery fragments and at the end of um, the excavation, after all the fragments had been washed, they carefully laid them out in the laboratory of the Hebrew University of Jerusalem. And they invited 50 different scholars to examine them. Now, sometimes there can be challenges with dating from pottery. And one of the challenges occurs when there are periods in history where the changes in style and decoration might happen more gradually than at other times. And in those cases, it can be slightly more difficult to pinpoint a specific date. And this is actually the case for the 9th and the 10th century BC. So the scholars examined the pottery and they were divided. Some of them dated the pottery to the 9th century BC and others dated the pottery to the 10th century BC. Um, now, in the 2008 season, they discovered carbonized olive pits in the city wall and in some of the buildings. So since the specialists were divided on the pottery dates, they decided to send the olive pits off for carbon dating at the University of Oxford. If the results came back dating the olive pits to the end of the 11th or the beginning of the 10th century BC, um, then that would support the biblical tradition. But if it was later in the 9th century BC, it would challenge the biblical chronology. So it was a fairly tense moment for the directors when they packed the samples off to be sent to the University of Oxford. And in fact, they were so tense that they inadvertently sent their credit card along with it. But thankfully, the credit card was returned to them. And so were the results. When the results came back, they showed that the average date given for the samples were from the early 10th century, supporting the biblical tradition. 
so now we have a fortified site in Judah, which has been carefully planned by some kind of administration. And it dates to the early 10th century BC, the time of King David. But again, the minimalist scholars were not satisfied. So the argument shifted. They started questioning the identity of the inhabitants of Kerbet Kayafa. How can we be so sure that this was an Israelite site? Maybe it was actually a Canaanite or even a Philistine site. Now, there's actually a clue from a scripture in the Bible regarding the identity of this site. 1 Samuel chapter 17, verses 52. And this is when the battle of David and Goliath takes place. And David has just defeated Goliath. It reads, now the men of Israel and Judah arose and shouted and pursued the Philistines as far as the entrance of the valley and to the gates of Ekron. And the wounded of the Philistines fell along the road to Sharaim, even as far as Gath and Ekron. So here the Israelites pursue the Philistines along the entrance to the valley. Um, the Valley of Elah, where the battle of David and Goliath was fought. And many of the Philistines fell along the road to Sharaim. And according to the text, the closest Philistine cities were Gath and Ekron. So you can see a map here. And here's Gath. And you have Ekron at the top. You have the Valley of Elah in the middle and you can see Kerbet Kayafa on the road. And so it's interesting, it's actually in the same location as the city of Sharaim described in the Bible. Also, the name Sharaim is interesting. It has a dual ending in Hebrew, and so the literal meaning of the name is two gates. Now, in the 2009 excavation at Kerbet Kayafa, a second gate was discovered at the city. This is significant because it's extremely rare for a city to have more than one gate because it's the weakest point. So if you're getting attacked, you really don't want to have to defend several areas. Now, sometimes large cities did have several gates, um, but with the smaller cities, it's rare to have more than one. And so both the location and the name all suggest that Kerbet Kayafa is actually biblical Sharaim mentioned in the book of First Samuel. It's also worth mentioning that the architecture of the site, um, which we talked about with the casemade walls and the houses built up against it, is completely different to Philistine and Canaanite architecture. You don't get that kind of city planning at those sites. In fact, as I mentioned earlier, you find the same type of design at later Judean sites such as Tel Beit Shemesh and Tel Beersheba. Now, as the team continued excavating, they also uncovered a lot of animal bones and they were able to study these to see what type of animals would have been consumed at the site. They discovered that most of the animal remains were of sheep and goats and some cattle. But interestingly enough, after seven seasons of excavating at the site, the team didn't find a single pig bone. Now, if you contrast that to Philistine sites like Gath and Ekron, which have also been excavated, they have around 15 to 30% pig bones. 
And pig bones are also found at some late Bronze Age Canaanite, Canaanite sites as well. So other areas were incorporating pig into their diet, but the inhabitants of this city were not. And this clearly is reminiscent of the dietary laws found in Leviticus. Leviticus 11 verse 7 to 8 states, And the pig, though it has a divided hoof, does not chew the cud. It is unclean for you. You must not eat their meat or touch their carcasses. They are unclean for you. And again, at later Judean sites, there's also a significant lack of pig bone among the excavated animal remains. Although at the Judean site of um, Tel Beit Shemesh, they did discover 0.0012% pig bone. So clearly some Israelite was indulging a little in their pork. Um, but generally speaking, in Judean sites, we don't find pig remains in the animal records. The archeologists also found these at the site. These um, clay shallow bowls are actually ancient baking trays. They were placed on the fire and bread would be baked on top and they were discovered in nearly every excavated house at Kerbet Kayafa. Interestingly, these baking trays are also not found at Philistine sites, again indicating that the inhabitants of the city weren't Philistine. Now, if you remember, one of the arguments put forward by the minimalist scholars was that there was no evidence for extensive writing. Well, as the team were excavating, they found an ostracon. An ostracon is a fragment of pottery with writing on it, either inscribed or written in ink. Uh, this one is written in ink and it had Hebrew writing on it. Here you can see a clearer representation of it. And this letter here um, is the Hebrew letter Aleph, which is where we get our letter A from. It was usually written upside down like this because it actually came from a pictogram of an ox's head. So at the bottom, you have its head, and then the two lines on the top are the horns. And over time, it became slightly more stylized. You have it here as well, um, on its side. And the reason why it's seen in all these different positions is because this is a very early form of Hebrew writing, and it hasn't actually been standardized yet. So later on, it would become standardized and would be written like our letter A. But at this point in time, it could still be written in different positions. And this ostracon is currently the oldest Hebrew inscription we've actually ever found. So it is pretty significant. In the 2012 season, a second inscription was found. This time, it was written on a jar and it was found in one of the rooms at the site. This inscription actually contained the name of Eshbal, which if you remember was the name of one of Saul's sons. Um, now this isn't the same individual because the inscription says it's someone else's son. But the interesting thing is that so far we only have evidence of this name from the Bible. And all the occurrences come from the 10th century BC and are mostly connected with King David's reign. So these two inscriptions are amazing evidence of literacy. And bear in mind that this site was located on the border of Judah. This isn't the center, it's not Jerusalem. It would be one thing to find writing in the capital city, but this is right on the border of the kingdom, which suggests that writing and literacy was widespread. And so if you look at what the site has shown us,
we've got a fortified city located in Judah. We have evidence of city planning and central administration. It was occupied during the 10th century BC, which is the time of King David. The location and the presence of two gates match the biblical city, Sharayim. The architecture, the ceramics and the diet are very distinct from Philistine and Canaanite sites. And there is evidence of widespread writing. So these findings have seriously challenged the arguments that have been brought forth questioning the nature of the Kingdom of Judah and the existence of a united monarchy. And I think it's incredibly exciting to see all the new discoveries that are being made in the field of archaeology. Um, I know for me personally, these things strengthen my faith in the validity and the accuracy of scripture. There's a verse found in the book of John, which says, when the spirit of truth comes, he will guide us into all truth. And I believe that God is even able to use the discipline of archaeology to guide us into all truth. So thank you all for listening. I think we've got a couple of minutes um, for some quick questions, if anyone has any. Yeah, uh, thank you, Jodie. Yeah, um, I think some of you guys are already doing this. So uh, if you do have questions, please like feel free to raise your hand in the chat or if that's a struggle just physically raise your hand and i'll try and pick you up but i think we had uh michael coles is that you dear <laughs> so you had your hands raised first so yeah if you guys unmute when you raise your hands and you can just ask your question oh thank you josie that was really good I, I missed a little bit where you were talking about the walls and how why they were built in that particular way with like two separate walls with a horizontal one in between yeah sure ashley do you want to go back to that slide so basically um, there, there are different ways to build walls and you can build just like a solid wall um, but that's a bit more costly, um, a bit more time consuming. So this was a useful way. Um, you have the chambers in between and in times of peace you can use it as like a storage room. Um, but if there's an enemy attacking um, and laying siege to you, you can also fill it with dirt and rubble to kind of make it more of a solid wall. So it's a good defensive strategy in that sense as well. Thank you. Sorry. Yeah, and I think, Jodie, were you saying that the fact that they had walls like that showed that people had planned out this town, it wasn't just something that yeah. they exactly exactly yeah. because yeah i'd also said if you if you look um the entrances um to these chambers are always in the furthest corner away from the gate so you see actually if you want to highlight the gate just so people know where the gate is yeah there's the gate um on the left you see the entrance to the chambers are always on the left um but on the right they're always on the right and so that's not something that just happens randomly that, you know, takes administration, that takes planning. Thanks, Daddy. Um, does anyone else have a question? Yeah, Milivan. I'd like to ask you, Jody, about uh, carbon dating. Uh, well, someone would ask me about that. Go on. <laughs> it is well known fact, uh, you know, two different groups of scientists uh, were uh, literally speaking opposing each other. And, and uh, it's almost acknowledged that carbon dating is not uh, adequate enough and not reliable enough. Uh, and they uh, it can't go any further than 14, one four million years in order to rely on, on the data, on the results. So in, in, in the light of that, how crucial is 
carbon dating in this particular uh, project? Okay, that's a very good question. Um, I think what I'll do is I'll just explain carbon dating a little bit, um, or just so that people understand. Um, so carbon-14 dating, um, carbon-14 is naturally produced in the atmosphere, so all living things will absorb it when they're alive. Um, plants, animals, humans, we're constantly absorbing carbon-14. Um, the moment an organism dies, it stops absorbing it, and the carbon-14 inside the organism starts to break down at a specific constant rate. Um, until eventually it will disappear altogether. So the idea of carbon-14 dating is to measure the amount of radiocarbon uh, found in an organic material, um, say like seeds or wood, and then to compare it to the amount of C14 in the atmosphere to kind of work out when the animal died or when the tree was cut down, for example. Um, now, there, there are things that can affect the readings. Um, so for example, there's something called the uh, marine reservoir effect, which is when you have samples from marine life or from organisms that ate sea-based food. Um, and when you radiocarbon date them, it can produce slightly older readings. So sometimes you need to factor those kind of things in. Um, you've also got to be careful to collect samples um, properly and to make sure they're clean because if it gets contaminated that can also affect the date it has to be calibrated properly um, so it's good to bear in mind that there are different things that can affect the readings um, now it it does seem that carbon dating has proved useful in many excavations um, in many cases it does match up with the ceramic dates um, but recently there have um, been some growing concerns over the accuracy of it. Um, so some studies suggest that maybe there is a slight variance with the, um, and discrepancy with the calibration curve, um, which I believe seems to be magnified the further back in time you go. So when you get to about, I think it's about 1400 BC, there appears to be a greater level of variance and it begins to stray from the ceramic dates. Um, so this is an ongoing question as well. And um, although radiocarbon dating has proved at times to be useful, um, it could be that the calibration curve might need to be refined a bit more in future. Um, with this particular excavation, um, like I said, there was Josef Garfinkel and Michael Hazel. Um, I think Michael Hazel um, prefers the ceramic dating and views that as more accurate. Um, Josef Garfinkel, I don't think, mines too much. Um, so I, I think they came to you know, a compromise and it does seem to fit in this instance the dates that um, we see from the ceramics as well. Ashley, did you have a point? Yeah, yeah, no, so it's, I think just echoing what you said that radiocarbon dating I think from what we've seen so far up to a certain point it's actually very accurate and very useful but when the periods of time become longer it's much less trustworthy so I think that's why it's like having two or three witnesses if you've got the pottery and the carbon dating and they're telling you the same day yeah. that's helpful but obviously you get into the areas of like paleontology where people are exactly. talking huge lengths of time and there's no other evidence to back it up that's where it's much less trustworthy but with things like archaeology where you have two or three sources um mm -hmm. it's it's pretty reliable it's a good kind of go-to for things like dating things like the dead sea scrolls and stuff it's actually really helpful because uh, to that point of time it's quite accurate so do, do i uh, take it that uh, this is uh, just uh, as a helping agent rather than um decision I would, agent? Uh, yeah i mean I will say I'm not a specialist in it, but from my understanding, it it can be useful, but we've also got to be careful with it, I think. Mm. There can be things that affect it. So. I'm glad to hear that. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. I think Tamara, did you have a hand up as well? Yes, thank you. Um, 
I just thought it was interesting, like Jodie was saying at the beginning, um, how this came about by people not trusting the biblical record at all in terms of David existing, and then once there was evidence for him, not trusting, you know, the type of kingdom, and then when they found the site saying, uh, but we don't know who was in the site, like it might not have been a Hebrew site. I just wondered kind of with the levels of evidence here that your conclusions seem to say they're quite conclusive that all of those um, criticisms weren't valid. Are the critics still finding something to disagree with or still not accepting anything? I just wonder what their position is now. Yeah, um, that's a really good question. <laughs> I, I don't think that the minimalist proponents have quite accepted it yet. Um, but I think among scholars generally, these findings have been well received. Um, I, I do think sometimes it can take a while for old theories to be discarded. You know, even with the Tel Dan inscription, there was still a lot of um, arguments back and forth for a while <laughs> after it was discovered and it, it did take a while for it to be accepted. So I think sometimes it can take a bit of time. Um, but among most scholars, I do think it has had an impact on um, their previous views of the early history of the Kingdom of Israel. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I think it touches on human nature. If you spent 10 years writing and researching a book and then yeah. something's discovered that tells you you were completely wrong, you're probably going to keep fighting that corner for a long, a long time, right? Cool. Yeah, Thanks, Tamar. Any other questions, guys? Speak now, forever hold your peace. Okay, um, cool. Well, thank you, Jody. I don't know if, um, is it possible? Oh, sorry. Not, uh, yeah, Dion, one, one more time, go ahead. Sorry, sorry. One more question. Um, so the, the layer of the village, I'm going to call it, I don't know if what the right word was, was there drainage on the site? Like, you know, for sanitary purposes or as well, or anything like that? Um, I actually don't know the answer to that. Um, I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Ashley, do you know? You've visited I've been, the uh, Yeah, I've been there a couple of times. Um, last <laughs> time we went, we got almost up to our waist in mud. So my gut instinct is there isn't now. Um, <laughs> but it, it's interesting because the site itself, I think this is sort of the fortified part is a little bit later than the original time is it's one of the hills that overlooks the Gila Valley, isn't it? Mm. So they say this is roughly, if you do read the story of David and Goliath, that the original place itself is, uh, when you read it, it'd be one of the camps that the Israelites sort of had that was overlooking the valley. And on another hill, just in the distance, you can see where the Philistines would have camped and they've done excavations there and found um some philistine stuff but i think this would have been built after that wouldn't it the the actual yeah. site probably in david's time but yeah after that period so there's a lot of like yeah history of the site around there but um but no i i i don't know if there was much evidence of drainage that you can still see there definitely isn't right now it's very very muddy <laughs> um but yeah it, it's interesting though you can just like walk up to them and see some of these things it's kind of open now because they're not doing that excavation so if you do ever go to israel i'd definitely say it's worth checking out okay, okay. well thank you guys um yeah we have recorded the session today so um we'll find a way to put that up uh, probably on the boys youtube page if you want to check it out again i don't know joe do you uh did you want to make the presentation available to people if they want to ask you for it i think about it. <laughs> <laughs> maybe yeah if you treat her nicely <laughs> um but cool well thank you so much guys we may uh, i don't know if i can persuade jd to do another one or not but i'll try uh oh do you have one more question over there uh, actually uh, just before uh, you disappear outside of this today, I've got something uh, not related to the present uh, presentation. It's related to uh, what we had during the Sabbath school and uh, just didn't have enough time. And uh, I've, got a, I've got a a scripture from Isaiah and it's got a a direct link uh, telling us about direct link 
between the Bible and uh, the science. And uh, it is, uh, I, I believe you we could use that in your uh, uh, study, what you presented last week, is Isaiah chapter 40 and verses 21 and 22. Uh, you, do you want, am I allowed to read it or do you, you do no, it you yourself? Can, yeah, no, you go ahead, go ahead. Well, here it is then. Have you not known? Have you not heard? Has it not been told you from the beginning? Have you not understood from the foundations of the earth? It is he who sits upon the circle of the earth and the inhabitants thereof are grasshoppers who stretches out the heavens as a curtain and spreads them out as a tent to dwell in. I mean, uh, do you want more science and Bible together than this? Thanks. Thanks for that, Milivan. Yeah, it kind of touches on what we're talking uh, about as well. Because obviously and, with archaeology. Yeah, yeah we, and, the, and also uh, the last one. We had the study about the word of God, you know, and all that. But obviously Jeremiah is quite uh, explicit about this and uh, even colorful to the point and might even hurt some sometimes. You, if you read that, it's up to you. Take as it as you find it. And in Jeremiah 23, chapter, verses uh, 29, 30, and 31, and 32. Is not my word like as a fire, says the Lord, and like a hammer that breaks the rock in pieces? Therefore, behold, I am against the prophets, says the Lord, who steal my words, every one from his neighbor. Behold, I am against the prophets, says the Lord, who use their tongues and say, he says. Behold, I am against them who prophesy false dreams, says the Lord, and do tell them and cause my people to err by their lies and by their lightness. Yet I send them not, not commanding them. Therefore they shall not profit these people at all, says the Lord. Big warning that is. And uh, I mean, you, you could start with this and uh, obviously lots of people have their own opinion, but basically that's what, what uh, we had uh, this morning in the Bible, uh, a lesson. Thank you. Thanks, Willavan. Okay, any any last points to wrap up, Joe? Just before we close. No. Okay, <laughs> yeah, close. Oh. yeah. Well, I've just put the um, text on the screen. Sorry, not the text. The conclusion uh, on the screen as well, in case anyone wanted to take that down. But um, yeah, once again, thank you guys for coming. I hope it's been useful. If you are interested in seeing any more, this is obviously part three, so if, the, if this is the first one you've seen, um, you can see the other two parts that we started with. They're on the Riverway website. So if you just go to riverwaychurch.co.uk in the media section there, if you scroll down, you'll see uh, Bible archaeology part one and part two, which give a really good intro and a lot more evidence from different sites. Um, but yeah, let's close uh, now. We'll just close with prayer. Um, Heavenly Father, thank you for um, this afternoon program that you've given us. Thank you for um, just seeing how your, how your truth is uncovered, Lord. You said yourself that the very rocks would cry out. And uh, we see this as we look at this archaeology, Lord. We see that it's sometimes prompted by people doubting the truth of your word. But the more that we dig, the more that we understand, the more that your truth is shown to be reliable. And we know that this process is still ongoing and we're excited about what more you have to show us. So we pray that you'll be with us, help us all to have 
blessed rest of the day and rest of the week coming up uh, is our prayer in your name lord amen Thank you. Amen. Amen. Thanks Amen. very much for joining, guys. And uh, yeah, good to see you. All. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Thank Bye. you. Thanks very much. Bye, guys. Bye.